equally as happy. He's just refraining himself. <laughs> so happy to have the Jeffers with us today. Let's give them a big hand clap. So thankful for their friendship. Thankful for everything that they're doing in Louisville and what they help us do around here. Daniel chapter 3 verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. What are they saying here? We don't even have to think about this, Nebi. Uh, we, uh, right? We don't even got to think about this. This ain't even a thought. We, I can answer you. I don't, have to th I don't have to consult with two or three. I don't have to ask for a lifeline. We are not careful to, you, to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. How many of us know that we just serve a delivering God? My, 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 I know it's been a week of weeks for some of us and that the devil's been on a rampage and I know that he's been tearing your world up. I felt it all week in prayer. But I'm going to tell you, he can deliver you. But I want you to watch these three Hebrew boys' response next. He whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. They spoke their deliverance. But now watch, verse 18, and this is, uh, is where I'm going to take my title from. But if not... <laughs> Ooh, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost right now. Be it known unto you, you better know this, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I'm going to tell you what, you better get a but if not in your spirit today. Behold! I'm going to tell you, they, uh, contrary to popular opinion, honey, it's not always going to be rose petals, but you better learn how to say, but if not, I'm still serving God. You can't change my mind. Woo, hallelujah. Clap your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We're so thankful to be in your house. Lord God, I already feel your anointing. I pray, God, that it carry into this message. And then, Lord God, you give us a change of heart today, God. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody shout it, amen. amen. Clap your hands and you can be seated to the, uh, under the Lord. This text that we read is perhaps one of the most memorable texts in the Bible. We learned about this in Sunday school, right? That's one of the first ones I remember because it had three little boys. Now, do I think that they were seven, eight years old? No, probably not. I think they were more like 18, 19 years old. I think that they were more like teenagers. And here they are. They're in a kingdom. And they were faced with a peculiar problem. Old King Nebuchadnezzar got lifted up in himself and he decided, I want everybody to worship my God, my Lord. But there was something that had gotten into these young men's hearts that they wasn't going to bow to no idolatry. I'm going to tell you if there's one thing we lack in this end time, it's non-compromisers. It's ones that are willing to stand up. I'm going to tell you there's a revolution coming. I'm going to tell you there's going to be a young people that are going to stand up. There's going to be adults that are going to stand up. And we're going to say, we're not taking this anymore. We're, but if not, I am going to serve the Lord. I don't care what you say, what you put me through. I am standing on the rock. Woo! My God. Lord have mercy, my, my, my. And so the chapter, this chapter, I'm going to give us a, back, a little bit of background. I'm going to settle us down a little bit here. It comes on the heels of Daniel's warning to Nebuchadnezzar. He had warned that Jehovah would judge and destroy his empire. But apparently he forgot very quickly what he was told. So he built this statue covered with gold. And he decided he was going to have everybody worship it. Can I tell you what, we think that, and I have an image in my mind of what maybe that looked like. 
And what, but you know, there's so many graven images in this world today. There are so many Nebuchadnezzar images in this world today. You look at your rock stars, you look at your movie stars, you look at your sports stars, you look at sports, you look at all these things. There are graven images among us, friends. Come on, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to meddle a little bit, and that's okay because that's my job, and I'm going to try to get real good at it. His kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar's, was well organized and well structured, as we note in Daniel 3 and 3. I didn't give you this, Brother Arms, because I didn't want you to be right and me to be wrong. So, then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that he had set up. In an effort to add to it a sense of worship, Nebuchadnezzar also added music. And the Bible lets us know that there was all kinds of music. And I know I mentioned this on Wednesday, and I'm going to hit it one more again. You better watch what we're listening to. Because <laughs> you're going to worship something. I'm going to tell you right now. Let's be honest. Okay, honesty party. How many of us have, how many of us have ever been in a restaurant and you heard an old song that, yeah, that you heard way back in the day, and all of a sudden that, ta- that foot just starts to tap, and you're, before you know it, maybe you're humming a little bit. I remember one time, Sister Lawson looks over at me, she's like, really, honey? <laughs> but it happens, right? Because music is so powerful. It is so powerful. Who created music? No, no, no. God created music, but he made the devil the choir leader. The devil knows how to lead some worship. Don't you ever get it mixed up. He was he was heaven's choir director. Brother Gossam, he's going to do me better than me and you ever thought about doing. But I'm going to tell you, he knows the chords to strike. He, uh, Come on now. Uh, and you better watch. It's one thing to be in a restaurant, Sister Lawson, and to be hearing that and just kind of tap your toe. It's something totally different if it's on your car dial. Whoa. Come on, I'm going to go ahead and hit it. You better watch what's on your radio dial. You better watch what's on your iPod and on your computer. You better watch what's on Pandora. That stuff will destroy you. It will destroy you. And he, uh, Nebuchadnezzar knew this. So he put all manner of music in on this idolatry worship. But no matter what, let me tell you what, even in 2016, there's a remnant that ain't going to bow. There's some people that are going to stand up for what's right. God is always going to have a people. He's always going to have somebody that says, nay, nay, my God can deliver me. But if not, I'm going to serve him. (laughs) There's always a few and we are. uh, It seems like they're always that minority. Why? Because God likes a good underdog story. Lord, I'm going to tell you, Sister Gossam, if there was ever an underdog story, I'm it. Sister Brittany, if there was ever one that should have never made it, it was me. If there was ever one that should have never been a preacher, that should have never even been in church, it was me, John Thomas, because I was a sinner. I was an ugly rank sinner. When I think back, if I could go back in time, I'd whip my own butt. I was just an ugly, ugly person. But then there was that day that God stepped in. (laughs) And everything changed. And even as a rank sinner, he did some miracle for me that I couldn't do for myself. And I hadn't done anything to deserve it. But he came right down and touched my situation. I didn't have to beg, plead, steal, or borrow. He came right in and he touched it. Lord have mercy. The underdog. I don't know how I got on the underdog, but it's good anyway. Don't you ever count yourself out because you don't think you're worthy. That's the very person God wants to use. The one that's failed a million times. That's who God wants to use. The one who doesn't think that they're anything. That's who God wants to use. My, my, my. I'm chasing rabbits. Come on, back on your notes. Death was staring them in the face, but could not disobey. Their peers said they were stubborn, stupid, and non-conforming just bow what in the world's wrong with you just bow just for a second you don't even have to mean it 
Let me tell you something. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Sister Lawson, I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. I'm way. It's hitting me like a ton of bricks. I'm, not, I'm just, I feel like I'm going to be long. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you compromise even a little bit, you're affecting your testimony. It's not okay just to bow for a second, just to save your little feelings, honey. You better stand tall for the Lord. Everybody's watching. There are people watching you, and there were people watching them to that day. Let's keep going. You will, the, their peers said, you will not escape the fire. You're not going to escape the ridicule. You're not going to escape the, what the world's going to rain down on you. You're trading off your high office. You see, they were set up in the kingdom. They had position. <laughs> they, they had a place in the kingdom, and they were defying the king of that kingdom. This was a big deal. The, let me tell you something. Don't you ever worry about standing for what's right. Even when it seems like it could hurt you or not be in your favor, you better stand for what's right. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to give a little bit of Sister Lawson's testimony. When she was working for McDonald's, she took a stand. She started out as a cash register worker, and they seen something in her. And I believe that every employer that hires an apostolic person should see something different and that we should work as we work unto the Lord and that we should be their best employee and that we shouldn't be one that they complain about. But I'll go on because they wanted her to go into management and they offered her a sizable increase in salary. Sister Lawson being 10 foot tall and bulletproof as she usually is, she may look small to you. I'm going to tell you right now, you better watch. <laughs> She looked at that owner and she said, well, I'm going to tell you right now, this is fine and all. She said, but I don't work Sundays. I don't work Wednesday nights. And I do have church and I do need off. And they said, you know what? We're going to work with that. And up until this day, they still call her every now and then. If you ever need a job, you come back. We will do whatever we have to to get you back. Don't you worry about flexing for a company and meeting their work schedule and doing all these things. When you stand for what's right, people take notice and they honor and God honors that and God will give you favor. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't care because we can do right and be blessed. Regardless of what the world says, the world says that you got to step on people to climb that corporate ladder. It's not true, Brother Arms. It's not true. If your work has done to God and you'll keep godly principles first, you will climb up the ladder. You will get where you need to go. And God will bless you as you're ready. My Lord, where did that come from? But it's there and it's good. And This didn't compute with everybody what they were about to do. But here's what we have to understand, that there are some who see the real value of the soul and refuse to trade it off for shallow things of this world. There are people that are going to stand. And I've seen people, uh, let's take Kim Davis. She had everything to lose, but she stood. I'm going to tell you, there are more for us than against us, folks. When you stand, there are more for you than there are against you. And don't you, don't you let this world whisper something else into your ear because God is for you. And regardless of who else stands with you, if you've got God standing with you, nobody else stands a chance. Clap your hands to the Lord. Now, as we go on in the story, immediately when these spiritual men refused to bow, some of the king's tattlers, anybody know tattlers? Y'all seen tattlers at work and, oh, Brother Barry didn't do this, or oh, Chris, he, he, he was messing around, he didn't do his job. Anybody run across that other than me? Oh, somebody, always somebody trying to tattle on me. Lord, I think my wife tattles on me. <laughs> But they went and they told him, they said, certain Jews, you ever notice how people do that? They won't call you out by name, but they'll be like, somebody over there, knowing that they're trying to t rat you out, but they don't want to do a draw. Oh, I never told, I just said somebody. I never told on you. People like, yeah, give me a break. I'm going to go. It said certain Jews who refused to bow down and worship, and it was used in a tone of voice that you would expect a racial slur to come out of. Certain Jews. You know what I'm talking about. And Nebuchadnezzar went out of his mind. He was so angry, and he ordered that the boys be brought to him. 
This thing about worship is serious business. The devil doesn't like it one bit when we refuse to worship the things that he set up in this world. Some of us are feeling the effects of this. Some of us this week, we fought hell because we refused to worship some of the things that the devil has to offer. But I'm going to tell you, he gets real serious about that. That's why when we come in this house, we need to be serious about our worship. We need not let a service go by where we don't lift our hands, where we clap our hands. We don't need to let a service go by where we don't shout, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because this thing about worship is serious. It's serious. See, even the world knows that. I mean, how many of us have ever seen a rock concert on the TV or you've been to a rock concert? Anybody other than me and you never seen it? People lose their minds at a rock concert. They don't care. I remember seeing one where they were out dancing in the middle of the place and they were kicking each other and punching each other and this was completely acceptable. My Lord, it would have looked like WWE and I, if there's somebody hit me like that. I, I, we would have, Houston, we've got a problem. But the world can find that acceptable. But the, some in the apostolic church can't lift our hands. My, my, my. They can come up with all these crazy dances and we're afraid to get out of our pew and maybe walk around and wave our hands. We're afraid to maybe run an aisle. The world will lose their mind. But we got to stay dignified. Lord, I, I, I read that David, his wife thought he was foolish. He was dancing so hard before the Lord. Come on, we got to learn to worship, folks. You, there's power in your worship. There is power in worship in general. But when you worship God, he's going to break into your situation. My, my, my. These men refused to bow. Now, here's what I want to tell you this. Hell's worst mistake that day was they allowed them three boys to be together. <laughs> Let me go on. Behold, the Bible says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together. What does that mean? You shouldn't find no reason to be out of church because there's going to be unity in the house. We can bind together with one another in the house. Whatever you're fighting, we can address that together in the house. I'm going to tell you right now, it says in the Bible, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You want God in the middle of your problem? Get together with a brother and sister. Get yourself to church and watch God work on your behalf. I can't stand this thing where something goes wrong and we seclude ourselves. That's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. As if you're falling right for his trap. You fall down, you get up, and you drag yourself to church because that's where healing is. Let me, let me say it like this. Sister Lawson, if you, were, if you were cooking dinner and you burnt my steak and I was real angry, and I cut your hand off because you done offended me with your steak cooking skills. Now, would you just wrap that dude up and stay home and pout about it? Or would you head to the hospital after beating me with the good hand? <laughs> exactly. When we get injured, how many of us have been seriously injured or somewhat seriously injured? Did you just go home and hope for the best? No, you didn't. You went directly to the hospital. So why is it any different when we fall down in the world, when we trip up and mess up, that we avoid the house of God like the plague, where you can get healing and restoration? Why do we do that? That doesn't make no sense. We need to drag ourselves to the house of God because that's where you get better. That's where you get healed. That's where you're made whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My, 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 where we're gathered together, the, de the devil can't do nothing with us. Can I tell you something? The devil doesn't care how much we preach as long as we don't get together. He doesn't care how much we sing as long as we don't get together. He doesn't care how anointed we are and how much I spit as long as I don't get together with my brothers and my sisters. He don't care if I'm, if I'm doing that by myself. He doesn't care how much doctrine we have. He doesn't care if we know that there's only one God and the devils know that and tremble. He doesn't care about that as long as we don't get together. He doesn't care how much prayer we have, how much structure we have, and he doesn't care how many are here today. 
as long as we don't get together. And let me tell you something. You can be in the house and not be together. You can be in the house and be a million miles away from this place. But when you get together, when your spirit gets with my spirit and we begin to worship God in one accord, there are foundations that come down. There are walls that come down. There are chains that fall off. My, my, my. And because on that day there were three men who got together, they ended up ruling that day. It didn't look good for them. It didn't look positive for them. It was a whole nation against three boys. And there was a fiery furnace to face. You need to know that when two or three get together, someone will show up in the midst of the fire. There are some on, a, and I'm going to tell you, there are people that have come to this church that aren't here today that they're dying on the inside and they want to feel what we're feeling right now. And there's some today that we know that are bowing to the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They want to worship, but they're suffocated by a grudge. They want to shout to God, but the voice is silent because they won't change their heart. They want to, they want to pat their foot. They want, to, they want to clap their hands. They want to do something, but they can't because... They can't get together with the brother. There's something there. So the devil just tells you to sit there and act dead because you are dead. But hell has made the mistake by letting you come to this church because there's a bunch of Pentecostals here that know how to worship and we know how to get past grudges and we know how to get past sin and we know how to get past all these things because we know the one who's greater and he lives in me and greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. So we need to understand that it's not about us. How many of us, how many of us failed this week how many of us came short anybody other than me so is there is there one falling short greater than the other is lying a bigger sin than giving my wife the evil eye what about murder is murder a bigger sin than rape so why do we judge is homosexuality oh here we go i'm gonna get i'm live in the crowd up here in a minute is homosexuality worse than extramarital affair? Well, well, well. No, it's not. I know the Bible says it's an abomination, but sin is sin is sin is sin. If we're going to call one sin, we're going to call it all sin. <laughs> there ain't no greater sin. There's no lesser sin. Sin is sin. Now, what makes the difference? All you got to do is make your way to an altar. And it doesn't necessarily have to be this altar. It can be an altar by your bedside. It can be an altar at your couch. It can be in your closet. And you say, God, I need change. And that's where grace comes in. And that's where intervention comes in. And that's where you can be loose to that thing. That's what makes the difference. Now, are some sins harder to get rid of than others? Well, sure. Sure. But if you're honestly trying to make a change... God knows the sincerity of your heart. Let me tell you, you don't need to let men judge you. You need to be judged by God and this book. <sighs> Lift your hands to the Lord right now. I feel him right now. My, my, my. Father, come into this house, Lord God. I know where you need to touch, Lord God, and you know where you need to touch. I pray, God, that as we're lifting our hands, that you would touch each and every heart in here, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What is somebody going to think if they see me not bowing down? What if someone sees me worshiping like these crazy Pentecostals? Can I tell you something? Uh, how many of us, uh, you're the first generation of Pentecost? I'm going to tell you, you couldn't run me off from this thing. When I, seen uh, when I came in, Sister Gill, I seen people with their hands raised and tears running down their face. And I knew something was real here. Because see, Brother McCord, every church service that I had been to, it was like a dried up library. It was pretty bad. It was, it was where that we just folded our hands and we didn't clap. We didn't do any of this, cra this craziness. If the, if the preacher had a good, a good point or something, we just did this. We were like, That's right. 
But I'm going to tell you, there's something inside of me that reminds me of the day that I was delivered. And I can't sit still no more. I've got to thank him. I've got to, uh, I've got to shout it from the rooftops because I'm, not, I'm a brand new man. Behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. And I thank God for that renewing every day. Every day. Ah, oh, my, my. True apostolic Pentecostal worship is not going to run anybody off. Not if they want to be here. If they are looking for true change. Now, it will run some people off. The people who don't really want to be here. The people who are not ready. The people who are just here to just cause trouble. People like that come to church. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah, Take my word. Yes, they do. But I'm going to tell you, the ones that are genuine, it's not going to run them off. They're looking for something different. Do you know what caused you to like Pentecost the first time I walked, or you walked in? I remember what it was for me, and I shared that with you. Just the fact that I could really feel the presence of God. I remembered as a young person desiring to feel God, desiring to feel something other than the emptiness I had. I remember the freedom and freshness that I felt. I remember I felt stirred in my soul. I didn't have to worry about someone shutting me up. I could shout amen if I wanted to. I didn't have to worry about an usher coming by to take me off because I was dancing in the spirit. I didn't have to worry about that. And let me, let me say this. I know that we don't have a lot of this around here, but that's going to change. I've been praying about it. It's okay to do outward worship here. It's okay to dance in the spirit here. It's okay to shout a little bit around here. It's okay to lift your hands here. You don't have to worry. I, I know at one time that maybe there was a church before here that didn't believe in that. But I'm going to tell you, Sister Arms, I believe in it. I don't only believe in it. I practice it. <laughs> Clap your hands to the Lord. But now the king says, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. I'll read our opening scripture one more time. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image that you have set up. And then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was, it was heated before. Y'all yeah, know whenever you've really messed up with somebody because their face goes from this to that. Uh, husbands, we know that face, right? When we do something dumb. I know that face. It scares me. I wake up with nightmares and cold sweats about that face. His face changed. He was so angry. These, these men, these boys that he had put so much confidence in were defying him. Somewhere in your life, you're going, to have, you're going to learn how to worship. And most likely, it will take place in a confrontation just like this. You get your deepest roots when you're at your worst. When, you're, when things, everything is going against you and it doesn't seem like it can get any worse, when you learn how to worship there, that's where you're going to grow. That's where you, uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, that's where God begins to anchor you. God lives in that place because he's wanting to work on you and he's wanting to work in you and through you. Don't despise those days because it's those days that you're being made. Think about a piece of iron that's being shaped and molded. Do we do that while it's cold? No. It's put in a crucible and it's heated up so hot that it's in liquid form and then it's poured in a mold and then it's beaten with a hammer. Anybody felt like they've been beaten this week? 
Come on, I'll be, I'll be, I'm with you. I've been through it this week. There have been some things that come across my plate that I didn't see coming. It was a blind side. But I'm telling you, I know in this that God is working. He's taking me to a higher level. Even though it seems I'm going down, Sister Melissa, even though it seems like I couldn't get any lower, Sister Brenda, I know that God is elevating me in all of this because he's working things out of me. Nebuchadnezzar's image wants you quiet because God inhabits the praises of his people. He puts you through these things. The enemy puts you through these things to quieten your worship because he knows that God's going to inhabit it. Some of us have let the images of the world choke out our spirit. Something ought to make you want to get up when you feel that image trying to slide in the pew with you. Let me tell you how to know if the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar's image has gotten a hold on your spirit. If when the Holy Ghost starts to move, you feel a tightening down. Right when you feel like breaking out, you get a shutdown by a hindering spirit. When you feel like standing up and worshiping, you feel a tense spirit pulling at you. When you feel like raising your hands, you feel a squeeze on your soul. That is the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar, folks. You have to understand that the climate of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom does not like worship being directed toward God because worship loosens its grip on you. And some have been gripped by this. But at the same time, there's been some here that are wanting to be set free. You want to break out of the rut of mediocrity. You felt out of, you don't want to feel out of place at worship. We can't bow down to these things. How many of us, how many of us have felt like we're in a rut? Okay, here, let me, let me help somebody. I am stirred in my soul because it feels like we're not getting traction. And I'm going to tell you, the devil ain't going to shut me down. People ain't going to shut me down. Ain't nobody shutting me down. As a matter of fact, I'm going to worship harder than I ever have. I'm going to lift my hands more than I ever had. I'm going to sing louder than I ever had because I know that God is going to help me overcome and that the victory is going to be sweet and there's going to be many delivered over it. And that's the same resolve you got to get in you. When, when he starts clamping down, like that you are on the verge of something amazing they were getting ready to get thrown in the fire that didn't look good my lord I don't even like getting too close to the bonfire I don't like that smell like smoke and all that trying to cook s'mores on a little burner somebody I was told last night that smoke follows beauty and it was going the opposite way of me every time. <laughs> my, my, my. I want to talk to us about how to live with a but if not attitude. There are some questions to consider in all of this. What in the world do you do when you see people you know falling down to worship an idol? What are you even talking about, Brother Lawson? Let me tell you, I've seen preachers that preach this doctrine fall by the wayside. What do you do when that happens? When you see great men of God that had once preached some of our largest meetings fall by the wayside and follow a different doctrine. I'll tell you what you do, Brother Arms. You keep after the, the only one true gospel, and that's Jesus is Lord of all, and he's coming back one day. Come on. We don't need to bow because of the latest trend. We don't need to bow because somebody says we need to bow. We need to keep on the straight and narrow. What do you do when somebody else that you love or you care for bows now these are rhetorical questions I don't want you to answer because we'll be here all, all day even longer than what Lawson, Brother Lawson wants to keep you what do you do when you see people who once held strong begin to bow down what do you do when you see people who were once faithful given to the enemy what do you do when there's fear in your heart and you're alone with your convictions Young people, what do you do when there's, no, when there's nobody around singing one of these wonderful choir songs, but it's just you and the world and a bunch of pressure? Older folks, when you're on the job, somebody wants to tell that dirty joke, are you willing to stand up and walk away, or are you just going to try to endure it? And then, Because look, I'm going to tell you right now, standing there listening to it is just as bad as participating. 
I, I know that's not popular, but it is what it is. Why, by standing there listening to it, you're condoning it. I'm going to tell you, I can remember many a times I had to walk away and people get offended. But you know what? I'd rather offend a person than I would God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I have a feeling that these men were gripped by fear at their core. And there are three points that we find in this story that can help us have a but if not attitude in our dealings with the world, in our dealings with the flesh, and our dealings with the devil. Man, I'm doing so good today. First thing, you have to faith your fear. No, I don't have a list. No, I'm not trying to talk like Mike Tyson. You have to faith your fear. Not face it. Faith it. Yeah, some of that hit y'all now. Y'all thought I was being silly. First, you have to faith your fear. You cannot face your fear until you have faith your fears to death. There has to be an element of faith that can literally choke the life out of your fear. How many of us have fears? Let's be honest. Everybody does. You have, a, you have to have enough faith in your God that says that this is not going to transpire, that I know that God has great plans for me and that he is for me and that he's with me. The Bible says that if I make my bed at the gates of hell, he's there with me. So wherever I'm at in my life right now, God is with me and I know that he's going to take me through. You have to let your faith build. I'm going to tell you the enemy, if he can destroy your faith, the battle's half won. You have to realize that there's nothing you can't overcome with God. If you will, for, look, most of our battles are lost between our ears. Because we, because we've done made up in our mind that we're done, that we can't do it. But I'm going to tell you, if you open your mind up and realize it's never about you anyway, honey, that if we'll just let God do what he wants to do, that he will take us through above and beyond what we could have ever thought. I'm going to tell you, when you release yourself from the prison of your mind, God can do the amazing with you. Don't look at today. Don't look at tomorrow. Look at what God would do with you. Look at what God has already done for you. He forgave all of your sins. He gave you a fresh slate I'm gonna tell you I would be an unjust judge I would because I would judge me you idiot look what you did but he was so faithful they were in a high these boys were in a high pressure atmosphere and people knowing and people were bowing down all around them but they let their faith prevail when fear starts talking to you, faith must talk back. Fear can never have the last word in your life. Come on, there's going to be things pronounced against you. There's going to, look, let me be honest here. There are going to be church people going to talk about you, going to say things about you. I pray it ain't in these four walls, but I'm going to tell you, I've experienced it. Church people pronouncing a demise on you you better not you better not give into that because i'm gonna tell you the only person that gets the last word there is god and i ain't heard a word from him yet and he ain't closed up the heavens yet my lord the just shall walk by faith not by the word of man but by faith and faith alone you better put one foot in front of the other and learn how to walk we walk by faith and not by sight. There's some things in my life right now that don't look very good. There's some things, no doubt, in your life that don't look very good. Well, yeah, they don't. But you know what? That's in this carnal realm. Huh. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. When you learn how to pray against that thing and just keep walking, things are going to open up for you. We have got to have the last word. My, my, my. And this one is the one I really like. We have to elevate our mind above what we see. We have to quit letting these dictate where we're going. <laughs> Ooh, Lord. I've shared this with some, but Brother and Sister McCord wasn't here, so y'all are going to have to endure this one more time. Brother and Sister McCord, when I first received the call about coming to pastor in uh, Shelbyville, and I was getting ready to come for our, my inaugural uh, 
uh, my inaugural sermon where I would preach for the very first time and they'd be like, oh boy, this poor guy needs help. But anyway, I came down here to kind of check out the, the, the building and make sure I knew where I was going. And it was a cold morning and there was snow on the ground and I was driving my son's little Hyundai Excel. It was the ugliest little car on the planet, but it was so dependable. So I drove it out here. And I drove up where Kentex Barbecue is, where they used to be, where it still says on the UPC website that the church is. Sister Melissa, there's a very, very, very large church there. I pulled up out front there and I was like, no. <laughs> and I drove around again. I checked my GPS again. I said, no. And it began to build. And then I looked and I said, Kentex barbecue, nothing. Big church, big ch I'm gonna tell you right now, at 5.30 in the morning, I think it was, I was in snow this deep in running pants, shouting a lap in the parking lots. I was ready to go. I had arrived, Brother Jeffers. I couldn't figure out why this church hadn't pre uh, trained up a preacher to come in behind Brother Gill, but I didn't care. I had arrived. It was my time. It's my time for God's favor. <laughs> it's my time to be blessed. <laughs> and I got home and my wife said, honey, for real. She said, I know better. That voice of reason. My Lord. I was walking by faith. No, I, actually, I was walking by sight. <laughs> so I got back home. And she says, you need to call Brother Eads. I said, I don't want to call Brother Eads. That's it. That's it. Honey. So I called Brother Eads. And Brother Eads said, no, Brother Lawson, no. You need to go down on Midland Trail. I said, oh, okay, no biggie. And I pulled up in that parking lot. <laughs> Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> and it was a gravel parking lot. And I was like, oh, Lord. I said, well, I can get past this. This is okay. And that's Sister Gill. I saw the bars on the windows. I was like, my Lord, what in the world? Lies, all lies. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you right now, when we walked in and we had that first service, we had some incredible moves of God in that building. And we began to preach and believe faith. And we began to believe that God was going to move. And we began to believe that God was going to make a way. And we began opening rooms and we began doing all these things. And it looked crazy. Because we were, on, <laughs> a lot of preachers got a really good kick out of this. We were on the backside of a Mexican restaurant. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I mean, metaphorically, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> Every service, there's got to be one moment like that. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you. When you allow your faith to take over what you see, there is no limit. There's no reason that we're, there's no logical reason for us to be here. But heaven had a reason and heaven had a purpose and heaven had a season. And somebody was willing to open up their minds beyond what they could see and step into what God had for them. And when, uh, when we begin to step, God begin to send. My, my, my. One more time. Clap your hands to the Lord. Man, I'm feeling this. These three young men, they had to get to the point where they were unwilling to let what they were seeing and hearing bring them down. Quit allowing the voices of this world, of family members, of uh, peers to bring you down. The only voice you need to hear is the one that comes from God. Ha ha ha. Woo! I'm going to tell you right now, don't, their journey's not your journey. Their walk's not your walk. You have to walk your walk, and it doesn't need to be dictated by anybody else. My Lord, your help comes from the hills. There has to be a higher plane of thinking in your mind. The devil, if he can attack your mind, the game is over. You have to open it up.
Let them call you a Jesus fanatic. Let them call you a holy roller or anything else they can call you. Because as time passes, you're going to discover that those same ones that was making fun of you, when it's time to pray, they're going to come to you for prayer. Because they're going to see that you stuck it out. They're going to know that you have something different. They're going to know that you know how to get a hold of God. My, 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 I've seen that too many times. You have those that are playing church that come to, come to work and they're all happy, clappy, and then they start to do some things that are questionable, right? And they start to live a way that's not conducive of a child of God. And all of a sudden, the holy roller doesn't look so bad because obviously he has a commitment to God because he doesn't allow himself to participate in all these other things. I'm going to tell you, we got a little bit of that going on at my shop right now. And there's been some things unveiled, and I'll just leave that there, but I'm thanking God for every bit of it. My, my, my. As a church and as individuals, we have to stay where we are we have to elevate our mind above the carelessness the lukewarmness and the bowing down that's taking advantage of our generation you know it's amazing to me the things that were wrong 10 years ago are no longer wrong today did god change his mind last i heard now <laughs> i'll say this the king james version hasn't been changed the word, let me, let me be very clear on that, Brother Jeffers. There's a lot of translations out there that I can show you book, chapter, and verse where they've taken the Bible completely out of context. You better, again, you better watch what you're reading. You better watch what you're hearing because there, uh, there's wolves in sheep's clothing out there. There's going to be some people that are going to try to lead you astray. We have to get above what this generation is bowing down to. We have to get above... This whole thing, this name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, live any way you want to, grace is sufficient. Yes, grace is, is sufficient. But that doesn't mean that we need to test the Lord. We, uh, he called us to turn around. He called us to repentance. If you look up the definition for repentance, you know what it means, Sister Brenda? It means to do a 180 turn and walk a different way. Walk opposite the way you were. Not continue on and just hope that God forgives you. That's not the way it works, honey. We have to change we can't afford to change our style. Let them mock, let them laugh, and in the course of time, they will be looking for a church just like ours. You know, there ain't nothing worse than a dead church. If you've ever been to a dead church, there's nothing worse to it. And let me tell you something, let me be very clear. I've been to some dead apostolic churches, deader than a hammer. I remember I was in Iowa one time and I was looking for the door I got about halfway through service, and I was like, oh, Lord, how do I get out of here? I felt bad. Not every church is going to be a good. Now, are there good churches outside of here? Absolutely. There are some great churches all around here, great apostolic churches. Brother, each church is a great apostolic church. Brother Browning in Middletown, he's a, it's not only held here, but you got to watch because there are some churches that are not so good. Hallelujah. So sometimes to elevate our mind, there are some things that we have to quit doing. Ooh, now we're well, back to metal mode. I like this one. Let me downshift here a little bit. These are some things that we got to quit doing. We got to quit waiting for perfection. We got we to quit waiting for everything to be just right before we do what we know we're supposed to do. We need to quit hoping for inspiration. We're going to hope our lives away. You need to quit hoping for all that mess and start doing something. We need to quit waiting on permission, unless it's from your pastor. Let me put that in there. We, quit, we need to quit looking for reassurance. We need to quit looking for a pat on the back. And I'm not saying that anybody in here is guilty of that. I'm just putting it out there. There's going to be some times where you're not going to get a pat on the back, even when, it, when it's deserved, even when you've went above and beyond. But the Jeffers, I'm sure there's been quite a few times that you went, went above and beyond and you didn't get a pat on the back. So here, let me be the one that, do, that does it. Because I love this man. I love his spirit. I love that family very, very much. But there's not always going to be a time when we're going to get that reassurance. We need to quit waiting on someone to change. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. As a youth pastor, 
Sister Alicia. By the way, it's so good. I'm so happy to have my daughter and Alicia with us today. Let's give them a good hand clap. As a youth pastor, I can remember hearing young people say, well, I can change him or I can change her. No, you can't, honey. A person has to want to change themselves. And regardless of what you do, they cannot change until they want to change. We, quit, we need to quit hoping for the right person to come along and be patient with God's plan and God's timing, young people. Don't go out there spending all your time looking for the perfect girlfriend or boyfriend. Let me be very clear here. <laughs> Don't spend your time doing that. You spend your time serving him. You keep your eyes on him. And when it's time, I'm going to tell you, if you put him first, he'll send you a prayer warrior. He'll send you a man of God that will lead you and that he'll bless you if you'll keep your eyes on him and follow after him in all things. I'm going to tell you, I, I've seen it time and time again where we, uh, young people rush to get married and they marry the wrong one. And I've seen where some wait and endure ridicule, endure all these things, and get the right one. Let's get the right one. Quit dreaming about change. Quit waiting for there to be no risk. Let me tell you something. If you're going to do anything in this world, you're going to have to risk something. You're going to have to put yourself out there. You, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I probably do it too much, but that's okay. I like risk. Quit waiting for someone to discover you. Quit waiting for a clear set of instructions. Quit waiting for more self-confidence. Be confident that God has put you at this place at this time for his purpose. When you get a word, go with that word. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. And this last one, I have more notes, but I'm going to end here. Quit waiting for the pain to go away. Quit waiting for that thing that hurts you to go away. Quit waiting for that person that hurts you to come back and apologize. Quit waiting on all these things. God's got it under control. Give it to God and do his purpose. And all of that will heal itself. God will heal every pain. Time doesn't heal every pain. I've, I've heard that a thousand times. Time doesn't heal it. God heals it. Stand with me all over this house. We need to get to the point that we understand that if God doesn't heal me, he's been good enough to me. It's all right. If God doesn't change this, I'm still going to serve him. <laughs> if God doesn't deliver this loved one, I'm still going to love him. If God doesn't save this one, it's okay because God knows and God is sovereign and I'm sure that God's given him or her the chance. If God doesn't, but if he doesn't, I'm going to serve him. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. There's some in here today that you're struggling, and I know you're struggling. God knows you're struggling too, but he sent me to tell you that if you'll just walk, don't worry about all of these things. Just get this but if not spirit in your crawl, that if I don't get deliverance, that I'm still going to seek after him. That I'm not going to let the things of this world dictate how I seek my God and my devotion and my commitment to him I'm going to open this altar today there's a God that wants to meet you here there's a God that wants to forgive you there's a God that wants to help you there's a God that is for those that won't bow down there's a God for this for those that are trying He's for the failure because he's going to help you become strong. You, God will be strong in your weakness. He will help you over these things. This altar's open right now. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 